Ladies and gentlemen, I know you don't believe this. I hardly believe it myself, but this is Tosh Talk in a new environment. Um, you usually see me in the living room, but I have many, many rooms in the house. I basically live in a estate. I live pretty much by myself and my wife, my wife and I, two of us. But we have this incredible space, and each room is very specifically made for whatever purpose. I have a pool room, swimming pool, as well as billiard room. I also have uh, like two or three kitchens, one for junk food, one for vegan, and one for this sort of vegetarian, because you know, when you're vegan, you don't have the meat to mix in with anything else. So we have a vegan kitchen, vegetarian kitchen, and then there's like, a snack kitchen where it's basically the refrigerator full of peanut butter and jam. That's another story, another episode. Here, we're in my office where I wrote many of my masterpieces, such as Sparkstastic, was written here. Well, about two pages was written here. I wrote it outside of the house, but nevertheless, uh, it's my studio where I think, where I plan, and this is a suitable place for Tosh Talks. And today's talk, chat, is about David Bowie's art collection. Uh, as you can gather, if you read my, my blogs, and if you just slightly know me at the very slightest, um, for Ever since 1971, every day I thought of two words together, David Bowie. So Bowie has been very much in my, um, not only in my heart, but in my brain on a consistent basis for almost 50 years, I guess. And when he died early this year, in January, it was like um, the worst thing, probably one of the worst things that ever happened to me. But life goes on, and um, I guess due to whatever reasons, Bowie's art collection is up for sale. Sotheby's auction house is arranging the auction, and they put out, look, I did some exercise, it's very heavy, David Bowie's catalog of, of his collection. Uh, 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 opens up, you get volume one. Volume two, and of course, three. Now, what's interesting is I have always read about David Bowie's collection, but I have the fog's idea what he collected. I think I just presume that he probably collected like Salvador Dali or some very popular artist or Jeff Koons' work and stuff. But it seems he had maybe like three or four deep, deep, deep interest in art history or art era. One that was kind of surprising to me was his fascination with British artists. I know you're thinking of Gilbert and George, David Hockney, you know, Francis Bacon, but no. He actually focused British artists before Francis Bacon. Artists from like the 20s, well, so from the teens to like, mm, <clears throat> Somewhere in the 60s, but like you know, the majority of the work is, was done in the 1950s. And the first volume of this book, you know, The Bowie Collector, um, and here's the back of the book. Um, I never really looked at an auction catalog before. This is really fascinating. This is a great, this is a great book, this is a, fan, a masterpiece. Because what you get in this book is not only images of Bowie's paintings and sculptures and drawings and design objects that for sale at the auction. But I also get a, a collection of, of really interesting little essays by Bowie's curator or a friend of Bowie or somebody who worked with Bowie on a project or something to do with the visual arts. And it, all the little essays are very well written and, and, and equally fascinating, especially of course if you're a Bowie fan. And the reason you are going to pick up this book, this catalog, is two reasons. One, is you're a huge Bowie fanatic like me, bingo, or two, you are a person uh, seeking information or material or you have a desire to buy paintings from Bowie's collection. And I presume that there are people like me who just want to own stuff by Bowie that he actually touched and appreciated, but then there's other people who probably just want to investigate like early British painters or, or, or objects from the Memphis uh, Italian design group called Memphis. So 
a, a, a auction catalog serves many purposes. And you cannot get this at a bookstore. You have to get it through the actual auction house to get it. So uh, I think this cost $150. It was a gift for my wife, for me. And you're not going to find it in any bookstore unless it's a used or secondhand bookstore who sells their collection, or their, their uh, you know, catalogs. But um, a must for a Bowie fan. Now, the art is a different question. Again, it's really sort of focusing on, on, um, on early British painters, um, which is kind of a shock. And there's a lot, oh, also, there's a lot of great photographs of Bowie that's never been, i never seen before. This is kind of interesting. This is Bowie by his painting, Portrait of Iggy, because David Bowie painted. Now, the funny thing is, if you ask me, do I think David Bowie is a good artist, visual artist, I would say no. I think he's too much of a fanboy, a fan of other painters. And whenever I see a painting of his or a work of art, it's always reflecting on his taste, which is exquisite, by the way. But it is this his taste. When he, it should be when you're doing art, it should be a, be beyond taste. It should have that like that special oomph or it thing. And he and when he does his his music is always like it and has that oomph. But his work as a um, as a painter is not that interesting to me. On the other hand, what he collected is interesting. Now, when you're, a, when you're like a star, you have a lot of money, it's not uncommon for that person to develop an art collection as an investment. And again, there's like two types of collectors in that field, especially in the entertainment business, or if you, somebody comes upon a lot of money, you either get an advisor, uh, art advisor will tell you what to buy, what's, you know, what's a good investment. And usually when you go see this person's collection. You can tell it has no soul, no interest, because the person's buying this work, it has no meaning to them except for the money value. Or if it's a name that's kind of, you know, hot at the moment or hot in history, you know, you just want to own that name, Picasso, right, Monet. So, then there's the other collector who just collects things that that person likes and he's really deeply in tune with. And thank God David Bowie is that second, the latter type of collector. So he collected stuff of, um, of, of, um, of many, 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 he seems to be really focused, I mean a great deal of his collection is focusing on, on um, let's see, hold on a second, he's focused on a lot of, he focused on a lot of painters like, I think the, okay, the, the one painter that comes over, comes up again and again and again in his collection is a gentleman by the name of David Bomberg, who I have never heard of. Though I suspect he's a well-known British artist in certain circles. Um, he was born in 1890, he died in 1957, and he did a lot of like sort of abstract painting of that time period. Uh, sort of a combination of, uh, well not abstract, it's landscape, landscape painting that filtered through his eyes, which is sort of a more abstract. And um, there must be at least, I mean, again and again, David Bomberg's paintings and drawings are throughout this catalog. So Bowie really had a strong focus on this one painter. Um, as I look for the catalog, I noticed that Bowie purchased a lot of art around between 1933 and 1997. So 1993 and 97 is when he purchased art. And I wonder why, I know he's an art lover, from day one. But I have to presume that two things. One, he, he became very wealthy in the 90s, like super wealthy. And two, um, he probably, due to his recent, uh, due to his marriage, he probably has a, finally a family home of sorts, somewhere the house, the collection. So his life, I think, became very organized domestically as well as business-wise for him. So he went, he, he, so that from 93 to 97, he was in great passion and intensity, and I would even say addiction, uh, in buying art. And the amazing thing about his work, he didn't buy like high price stuff. A lot of the work is very like not low price, but like very reasonable. Um, for instance, well, and he also bought like works like uh, Percy uh, Wynnum Wynnum Lewis, who was a friend of um, Ezra Pound from the teens. And uh, Lewis died in the 50s, a very controversial British figure. Um, 
he was a graphic designer, painter, uh, writer, a novelist, a, a man of many, many talents, and, uh, and quite controversial of his time. And um, so, if, like, for instance, this, this painting right here is like, well, like a, a, a painting of a circus, his view of a circus. Um, Lewis, it's, it's, it, the price range is like, is like th this, this course get more expensive because of the auction, but it's like the minimum is $66,000 and the maximum is $92,000. And I would think Lewis would be much more in my mind, but, uh, but that's not the case. And, um, and he also he has like some uh, older art by a, 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 a painter and uh, artist by the name of, of Henry Lamb who was part of the Bloomberry um, uh, um, movement, literary movement, art movement in, um, in London, like from, oh, probably, gosh, I don't got it, from the 20s into the teens, teens to the 20s. Um, so, he's a, so, he had a fa so he had a fascinating, oh, this is a great painting. This is by a guy named Harold Gilman, um, who was part of this group called the Candom Arts Group, which is this sort of like the new painters at the time, but it's like in the teens and 20s. And this is sort of like a sweet little painting of a of a of a, a, a woman looking at a room, and you presume the room is like a boarding room, like a hotel room of its time. There's nothing really personal there. It just seems kind of you know no no object except for the, the dressing table, and um, it's a painting skill that's really nice, and it's a nice quiet painting. I never heard of this artist, and I actually saw I saw this painting in person um, about two months ago. Um, Bowie's some of the some of the paintings from his some of his work that's going to be sold in the auction was at the uh, in Century City for two days, and I went to look at some of the work. It was just like forty out of you know I think he has like hundreds hundreds like five hundred pieces for sale. There's like like forty works that they sent to Los Angeles, and uh, uh, Sir Jacob uh, Epstein, another sort of obscure British artist of the time from like the teens, and um, oh, this is one of my favorites. And I actually saw this painting at the, at the exhibit. This is Frank Auerbach, who I have heard his name, but I, don't, I never knew his work. And now I'm totally obsessed with his work. And if you watch my last episode, or if you see it, I did a Tosh talk on London, on London painters, and he's one of the painters in the show. And Auerbach is a guy who paints one model over and over and over again. And at first, when I looked at this, when I saw the original, I just thought it was this abstraction. I just thought it was this uh, abstract painting. But then it like, took me like 40, 50 seconds, and I realized, oh, wait, that's a nose, you know, there's a mouth. And so, like, it, you see a face, is sort of, it's almost like you're looking in the ocean, and you see something in the ocean, but you see this thing floating up slowly, and you see the features and the, the details of that object. And that's what his paintings are like to me. So he focused on landscapes as well as uh, portrait, uh, the portrait of this one woman that he knew for uh, many, many years. And I think she was a professional model. It wasn't like his wife or a lover or a girlfriend. It was just a model that he used on a consistent basis. And Orbach was in the same generation and friend of Francis Bacon, Freud, and those uh, English painters. Here's a picture of Orbach. And you get, like the, you get a great essay on Auerbach. It's really interesting, very slight, but really, really knowledgeable. The other, okay, the only contemporary art that I thought was really contemporary was um, Jean-Marcel Basquet. This, this really nice little beautiful piece. It's not a big painting when you see it in person, but it's, it's really impressive. And, he, and Bowie, as far as I know, has two paintings by him. And as far as I can gather, that is the only contemporary artist Maybe in Bowie's collection. This is, see, this is what's for sale. Bowie also had, uh, the family, the estate is also keeping art in this collection, and we don't know what's in, it, in that collection. So that's like in Bowie's home somewhere in the world. But what we're seeing is stuff that, he's sell that the estate is selling, or Bowie wants to be sold. So Basquiat is like the one of, you know, this is the other painting, which is huge, and this is like going over a million dollars. But most of the work in his catalogs are way under a million dollars. And some are really quite affordable. Some are like this couple hundred dollars or five hundred dollars. You know, different artists, of course, more obscure artists. And um, so the first volume deals with painters. Uh, here's Graham Sutherland, another sort of classic English painter from like the, you know, from the 40s, 50s. Um, my favorite, oh, this guy, I love this guy, this is uh, Patrick Caulfield. 
Um, I did a lot of stuff in the 60s and 70s, 80s, and there's like the painting. This, they actually have this in the, sh in the bow exhibit. Kind of graphic already, yet very kind of funny and humorous, almost pop art of the sorts. A nice little portrait of him. Reminds me of Boris Vian for some reason, my beloved Boris Vian, but it's, it's Patrick. And uh, so that's, a, that's volume one. Volume two uh, deals with um, more of English artists. And um, this is kind of an interesting photograph of Bowie looking at, over his books. He has an interesting book collection of sorts. I could tell he buys a lot of secondhand books and used bookstores because there are a lot of more older editions. Buy stuff from the 60s. Like he has a book on Soupy Sells by Soupy Sells. And you got to think about it in Tin Machine. He worked with Hunt and Tony Sells, the son of Soupy. So that's kind of interesting. He has the old, less traveled Stephen Fry book about poetry. He has a French English dictionary. He has 33 and a third, you know, those books about albums on Eno's uh, Another Green World. Uh, he has a book on F. Scott Fitzgerald and uh, Maxwell Perkins, their letters, their correspondence. And uh, that's, why is that interesting? I just find people's work. And okay, here's some more David Blomberg drawings. The, the one artist that he collects over and over again. Some of Frank Auerbach's like uh, watercolors. And again, uh, Auerbach world was very limited. He just painted what's around his studio, like outside his studio. So it's like the street uh, outside his studio. And he just, he did over and over again. He just painted the same image, but different, of course. And Leon Ka uh, Kossoff, who is another e London painter of, of note. Uh, this is his work right here, uh, a friend of Auerbach. In fact, I think they, I think Auerbach studied under him in school. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, this book is totally fascinating on so many levels. Peter Lanyon, L-A-N-Y-O-N, a guy I don't know, these two of his paintings. Bowie collected him exclusively as well. He has many, many paintings in his collection of this particular artist, another um, English artist. And then he has like Picasso's, you know, Picasso's, you know, dishes. But I th only a few. I mean, not, not a whole lot. He has a cocktail and Picasso. You got a, if you got a Picasso, you must get a cocktail. So there's a combination of like uh, plates. But he has very little of that stuff, to tell you the truth. He doesn't, he, he, he really focused on, again, on uh, David Bromberg. He's just crazy about David Bromberg. Uh, and then he went into, you know, during the Heroes and, and uh, Low uh, time period, he got into expressionistic uh, painters uh, or artists like Eric uh, Heckel, if I pronounce his name correctly. I'm probably mispronouncing it, but he's a, did a lot of woodcuts. And, um, and Emil Nold, who at one time was rumored that David Bowie was going to play him in a movie, a film bio, during the Low Heroes period. So this is definitely attached to the Heroes Low. And again, there are very detailed information here, like where Bowie bought the works from and what year, the exact date. But there's certain things like, like, like this stuff, like the, the stuff from Germany does not give a date whatsoever or how he purchased it. So I'm going to say that when he was in Germany, I, that's, a, that's an educated guess, that he purchased it uh, during the low and hero time. And he also interested in Art Brut, which is a uh, uh, all outside artist, sort of like uh, art from uh, 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 patients from mental and mental hospitals or schizophrenics, stuff like that. So he had a pretty large, sizable collection of um, art from uh, from outs outsiders, um, uh, people who were not officially looked at as artists, but like were mostly like patients in a mental hospital. Very obsessive type of stuff with you know little writing. Fascinating work. And then we got, and, then, and, Bo, and Bowie has a lot of collection of like landscapes of various artists, like obscure landscape art. And, you know, one tends to think of landscape art as just like, oh my gosh, every time you go to a hotel room it has a landscape art or, or, or a restaurant. But the true landscape art conveys a sense of psychology more than the actual image. You know, what, what, what you see, you see a tree and stuff like that. But it's how the artist looks at that landscape. And that is like, to me, like when I look at my white walls or my white ceiling, I project things from that, that, from that image. You know, it's a white ceiling, it's a white wall. There's a tree out there. But the way an artist looks at it 
it's actually become something more magnificent or even something depressing or something incredibly beautiful. It really depends how it's portrayed. And I think Bowie liked the idea of somebody looking at something and how they, how they, they focus on it. And in interviews, Bowie talks about being psychologically, emotionally hooked up to his art, where he, he need, not only need, need to own it, but he really need to look at it to, 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 to either feel him or re-feel him or, or just, you know, Tuma was like another form of music for him, you know, he just loved it. Another artist that he collected was Eric Gill. And Eric Gill is like a very, I want to say, I want to say conservative English artist from like the teens and 20s, 30s, a graphic designer. He did like his own alphabet, um, did a lot of drawings, and he was also a writer, a, a theorist, uh, and very, very English, very English, and Bowie uh, collected his works. Um, I find that really totally fascinating. Um, where is it? Where, where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? So much stuff here to show. Sorry. Oh, and okay, the other thing that Bowie focused on in the 90s was art from Africa, contemporary art from Africa. Um, there was a guy named Norman, Norman Catherine, if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. Um, a contemporary artist from South Africa. Bowie spent some time in South Africa in the 90s, and he really was there just to focus on contemporary art. Not old African art or old like, um, stuff, but like new artists. And one piece that really impressed me that was in the Bowie show um, in Century City was this piece right here. Now, one reason why I love it is because it's vinyl record, <laughs> and there's like a sculpture, and on top of that, so, or, you know, it's a sculpt, work of sculpture. Now, I'm going to mispronounce his name, but his name is Ro, Romald Haz, Hazume. It's, first of all, it's R-O-M-U-A-L-D. Last name is H-A-Z-O-U-M, accented E. And he's an African artist, contemporary artist, and he's really great. I really like his work a lot. It's mostly assemblage work. And his huge thing, I think, is really about um, recycling. He's into recycle. And I think all these elements, like the record, the vinyl, uh, uh, the piping, um, this is actually from a stereo, you know, like a radio, is all from related to his, his uh, homeland or, or part of Africa that either manufactures these things or maybe cause a great deal of pollution in that area. So it's really fascinating. And then, so okay, so two volumes into the, you know, into the paintings and drawings. And this one's actually very interesting if you're a designer. This is all graphic design, not graphic design, this is all designed objects. Mostly from a group called Memphis. And Memphis is a group of Italian designers who, uh, who started a group and they had a meeting. And it was like in 1980 and they played Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde in the back while they were having a meeting. And there's a line uh, stuck in Mobile, because I've got the Memphis Blues again, something like that, some Dylan line like that. And they went, ah, Memphis. So another reference from Bob Dylan to another world altogether, Italy, Milan, and this group called Memphis. And they built, like, this is great. This is actually built by, uh, um, I think, somebody from the Memphis group. It's, okay, this is... This is a typewriter. So this is like a case for a typewriter. And this is the actual typewriter itself. And what's so great is Bowie actually worked on this typewriter. He printed, he, he typed his lyrics on, on, on this work. And it was originally built in the 60s, like I think in 60, designed in 1969. And the designer is Ettore Sattas. He's Italian, Ettore Sattas. I can't pronounce his name. He's extremely famous, S-O-T-T-A. S-A-S-S, -S -S. any graphic designers out there or design fans, excuse me for mispronouncing his name. But he's sort of the main figure that Bowie uh, collected. He collected a lot of his work. And um, like this is like sort of a, a, this is like a bookcase of sorts. So the bookcase goes like that, like that, like that. A lot of bookcases and stuff. And um, the one thing, okay, this is, this is what I want. This is a radio television set. No television. It's a radio television. It means like a radio. And it's a turntable. 
and this is the turn, here's what it looks. So right here is the two speakers, here's the dial, the radio, and back here is the turntable. So you can have it like that, or if you have room in your apartment, you have this. Incredible. Anybody who likes records or turntables would want this. I mean, this is beautiful. And when you look at it, it's like the color, the chip of the wood is like chipping off. You know, it looks even better when it's all chipped and kind of funky. And Bowie, uh, my understanding of Bowie, this was Bowie's turntable. This was Bowie's main instrument of listening to music at home for like years. So I'm very impressed with that. And he collected little radio things by the Memphis group. It's kind of impressive. And, uh, ah, and here's like another crazy like bookcase type of thing, which is fantastic. So Bowie, okay, so Bowie had collected, he collected contemporary, contemporary African art. He collected British painters from like before Francis Bacon or, or pop art. Uh, and he collected stuff from the Memphis group. And, uh, and then some, oh, and he also collected, he has a couple of like Marcel Duchamp pieces. But not, but not originals, they're more like, uh, well, original editions, like, you know, like edition of 10, 100, so forth. And, um, um, Again, you know, it's very interesting when you look at some of these collections, as I mentioned before, I feel like I'm getting a self-portrait of Bowie, or like you're getting into, the, into, into his head in a way, the way he purchased this art and his passion for it. And again, as I mentioned, there's two type of collectors, the collector who just buy stuff just because it's a well-known name or it has a certain money value to it. And then there's a collector who just buys this weird stuff just because it sort of expresses themselves, you know. Um, John Waters has a fascinating collection of, of work that really expresses John Waters, or, or the, the group The Cramps. I've seen pictures of their collection, a record collection. It's like a portrait, it's like a self-portrait of the, of the collector. And this book is very much um, probably the closest thing we're going to get to Bowie's memoir of sorts, his autobiography. Because his collection, his art collection, I think fully and honestly expresses his interest in the world and what he was, his concerns were. And um, it's kind of a shame that somebody doesn't keep the collection intact and make it into a Bowie museum. But that's not very realistically, it's not going to happen due to, I think, you know, estate taxes and space and money to keep a collection together. But um, this is a great book, it's a great catalog. And uh, again, some of the art is very affordable if you have the money. The, uh, I think the auction will be November 12, 2016 in London. And that is another episode of Tosh Talks. And forgive me for rambling on about a subject I deeply care about, but that's, that's the nature of the world. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.